Today, uh, and in chapter five, we need to cover one last little structural issue. I say little. One last really super important structural issue uh, that we have to cover before we can get a full understanding of organic molecules and the reactions they undergo. And that, uh, that last little issue is to do with what you might call molecular handedness. It turns out that just like people, some molecules, not all, but some, can be, as it were, left-handed or right-handed. And uh, today I'm hoping to get as far as understanding uh, when you're looking at a carbon atom that has this property, we call such carbon atoms chiral, C-H-I-R-A-L, uh, and how therefore to tell whether you're, you're looking at a compound as a whole, a molecule as a whole that is chiral or not. Now, the reason you need to care about this issue is because chiral molecules are legion nowadays in pharmaceuticals for both humans and animals, in anything touching water or soil treatment. It's really commonplace for these molecules to be chiral. And in particular, it's usually, maybe not always, but usually important. In other words, we need to care whether we get the left-handed or the right-handed compound. It matters which one we use. And I would say this first, this issue first started coming into focus uh, was before even my time, but probably the late 50s, the early 60s in the previous century. Um, so, so even I wasn't alive yet, if you can believe that. Uh, but, um, uh, and the reason it didn't come up much before then is because most of the major pharmaceuticals that we were using uh, were not chiral. And this would include things like, oh, I don't know, aspirin, not chiral, so not an issue. By the end of the day, you'll be, by the end of this class, I'm hoping you'll be able to look at the structure of uh, aspirin uh, and confirm for yourself that it is not chiral. And yes, since some of you are bored and want to figure that out, I'll even draw aspirin for you. You might even have made aspirin in like a high school chemistry lab. It's acetyl salicylic acid. So it's the acetate ester. Salicylic acid is, uh, is um, phenol with an extra carboxylic acid group. So it's sort of, uh, a, you could call it hydroxybenzoic acid, 2-hydroxybenzoic acid maybe. I don't really care what you call it. But aspirin is the acetate ester on the OH, so that's aspirin. And you can probably already convince yourself this compound is not chiral. And most drugs were of this type uh, until then. But what really brought the whole thing into very sharp and sudden focus was a drug that I think came out in the late 50s uh, that was for uh, morning sickness, it's called thalidomide. Perhaps you've heard of it. Uh, and at the time, I, I'm sure that chemists knew that it was chiral. They could probably tell this. We'll define that term very shortly. Uh, but I guess they just didn't fully appreciate how much it mattered. And so they would give uh, the pregnant women who were suffering from morning sickness a mixture of both enantiomers, the, the, the right-handed one and the left-handed one. They would give them both compounds, not realizing that one of those two compounds was the good actor that relieved uh, morning sickness, but the other one was a terribly bad actor and caused horrible birth defects. And it was very sad. Of course, no one knew until the children were born. So they, they put the old kibosh on that drug pretty quickly after that. Uh, so this is why uh, we need to consider this structural idea, and most applicable today is we need to, at least oftentimes, we need to make sure we're providing the correct enantiomer, the correct whether right-handed or left-handed compound. Make sure that we're giving the patient only the right one, uh, at, least, um, uh, at least most of the time. Now, a couple other things that are a little less dramatic than thalidomide, uh, if you've ever taken Advil or Motrin, that's ibuprofen, that's a chiral molecule also. I don't know the structure off the top of my head, but you can find it, I'm sure, with one Google search. Uh, and so my understanding is they don't bother 
giving just the correct enantiomer or the correct left-handed versus right-handed compound with that one. Uh, and if, if, I, if I understand rightly, it's because when it hits the acid in your stomach, it interconverts the two left-handed or right-handed anyway. So even if they went to the trouble and expense and separating an antimer, separating left-handed from right-handed molecules is big, big money. It's a huge industry nowadays. I'll just give one quick uh, uh, tangent. What, me go on tangents? That never happens. I'll just give one quick tangent on that whole topic, which is if you come up with a way to separate enantiomers, to separate left from right-handed chiral compounds quickly and cheaply, you will become stupidly rich. And I will not begrudge you one cent of all of that money, because that's a really important business. You can already see why in the pharmaceuticals industry. But my understanding with uh, ibuprofen in particular is the enantiomers interconvert in stomach acid. And so there's not really anything they can do about it. And if I recall correctly, the, the better of the two enantiomers uh, is a little bit liver toxic, and the other one is like really, really, really liver toxic. So that's why they tell you to limit the amount of ibuprofen you take. It, it, after a while, it's too much on the liver. Uh, but I mean, we could go on. There are other stories like this. I, I can't quite remember the name. I think there's also a psych drug that they actually offer both ways. You can get it just as the pure enantiomer, you know, the, the, just the one. Uh, and you can also get it as the mixture of left-handed and right-handed. And I believe both are affected. I don't know. I, <laughs> I don't use that drug. I, well, anyway, we'll, we'll just stop there. <laughs> but I know there is a psych drug that does that. Uh, good, let's see. Uh, I'll add that to the list of accomplishments with better people than you will achieve. Well, join the club. <laughs> uh, did we... Um, Chiral means it's either left or right. Well, we're, we, we're going to define chiral carbons in just a moment, actually probably right about now. So, but hopefully that gives you some flavor for why this is such an important issue. Uh, I would say especially in anything involving pharmaceuticals or anything like pharmaceuticals, or to some degree, this impacts the materials industry also. Once you start, you know, making polymers with a particular structure and properties, then you've got to start worrying about this sort of thing. So... Uh, we're going to define uh, a chiral carbon as a carbon atom that has two properties, and it must have both of these properties, or it's not chiral. One is it must be sp3 hybridized. If it's sp2 or sp, game over. That carbon is not chiral. And it also must be bonded to four different groups. Now, someone in chat was saying they thought it was four different atoms, or four different elements. I don't know that it needs to be four different elements. Uh, you, for, for, all, for my money, you can even put down that it's bonded to four different things, where, for instance, an ethyl group and a methyl group are different things, right? They're both carbon groups, but they're different from one another. So that's how you can tell if, if a carbon atom is chiral or not. Now, I am only talking about carbons here. It begs the question, uh, can atoms other than carbon be chiral? Answer is yes. I don't think we're going to see any examples of that, although I, I don't think I'm going to shock anyone by suggesting that one element that you can, you can, have, you can have existing in chiral forms is, besides carbon is silicon. No big surprise. Silicon's right below carbon in the periodic table. So kind of makes sense. Uh, so that now that we look again at the structure of aspirin, acetyl salicylic acid, you can see there's no chiral carbons. All of, these, all of these carbons, all the ones in the benzene ring, all of the carbons except this one are sp2 hybridized. And that carbon's sp3 hybridized, but it's not bonded to four different groups. It's got three hydrogens on it. So as soon as it doesn't uh, uh, have one of those characteristics, as soon as it's not sp3 hybridized, or as soon as there's any two of the same thing attached to the carbon, game over. It's not chiral. But uh, you can make a relatively small molecule that would be chiral, like this one here. Uh, how, what shall we call that guy? How about bromochlorofluoromethane, right? We go alphabetically. And you can see for yourself that there's two different possible ways to put that together. And these two cannot be interconverted. So let's see if this works a little better. Oh, wow, I don't even need really to approach the camera. 
that's probably already better than, uh, than the little tiny modeling kit I had. But um, let me just sort of get these. Okay. So when I put them like this, I think you can see that they're mirror images of one another. And that's, that's the characteristic of what we'll shortly call enantiomers. The, the uh, two enantiomers are two left and right handed molecules. They're, they're a pair that we get whenever there's a chiral carbon atom. And you can see they're mirror images of one another. And, and that's what we mean, I'll, I'll write down a definition shortly, but that's what we mean when a carbon is chiral. And we call the two possibilities that you can get uh, enantiomers. That's the term that we use here. And uh, hopefully we can at least get through enantiomers. If I get to begin the discussion of diastereomers by the end of the class, fantastic, but I'm not gonna push it. Um, let's at least just start with enantiomers. So uh, the other thing they say about uh, the left-handed and right-handed species or the two enantiomers, if you will, they'll often say that these are not just mirror images, but non-superimposable mirror images. And what people mean by that is if you try, I mean, I can't really make two objects occupy the same uh, three-dimensional space, right? But if we imagine that I'm trying that, what you'll find is that you can get the carbon and any of the other two groups to match up. So I can get these two to match up, maybe that's the two hydrogens, and this, that maybe that's the two fluorines, I don't know. So those three atoms are matching up. But if you look, these two are backwards. The bromine and chlorine are backwards. And no matter what you do, and I would suggest you get with some models and play around with them, no matter what you do, you're not going to be able to get them to superimpose. They are permanently distinct from one another. And really, this is a type of stereoisomerism uh, similar to what we saw in cycloalkanes with uh, cis and trans, and also in alkenes that you have cis trans and EZ. So this also is a type of stereoisomerism. Uh, and as a result, we're gonna need names for these. We can't just call this bromochlorofluoromethane. We need different names for these guys. And uh, we'll, we'll learn that one of these is gonna be R bromochlorofluoromethane and the other will be S bromochlorofluoromethane. I'll also let you know right up front that I'm not going to ask you to learn how to tell which is R and which is S. And the reason for that is, although you kind of know what you need to know already based on telling E from Z isomers with alkenes, it's very much the same uh, type of thinking. I'll, I'll be honest, it, it's a pain and it's kind of time consuming and all you get out of it, this is what I was thinking last year when I taught the class for the first time. So you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I'm thinking you got to go through all this work and set up the priorities and turn the thing a certain way and turn your steering wheel. And if it's a right turn and it's a left turn, it's that. And all you get at the end is R or S. <laughs> you could have flipped a coin and had a 50% chance. I just don't think it's worth your trouble. I'll be honest. So I did just like I did with um, the aromatics. I left some questions in the owls that involved uh, um, directing groups, just so you had some exposure to it. But just like I'm not gonna put that in the exam, same thing, uh, uh, I'm not going on the exam to ask you, is this R or S? It's kind of a dumb question anyway, because, you know, A, R, B, it's a dumb question, you know? Uh, so. Uh, I will ask that, you're, that you be aware that R and S are going to be the names of respectively one of these and the other, and whichever one is R, the other one is S. That would be great if you knew that. But going through the procedure, it's all of this, it's a huge effort to get a tiny amount of information. See what I mean? And I, I just don't think it's worth your trouble. So I would like you to be aware of the uh, phenomenon for sure. I'll use some toothpicks and ground no. Actually, that would be, be kind of cool. Well, anyway, uh, if, you, if you happen to have toothpicks and grapes around. Before I get back to the, uh, before I get back to, well, you know, before anything else, I really should make sure that we, uh, um, uh, large sticks and the, don't oh, know. <laughs> I'm not gonna comment on that. Okay, chat, you're so funny. Uh, so anyway, let's make sure that we at least define the word enantiomer, or really enantiomers, plural. 
and it's in the class notes, but I mean, I want to be thorough if I can. Uh, first of all, the word enantiomer refers to a relationship between two molecules. So that's why I'm using the plural. There's no such thing as, as an enantiomer. You know, this molecule is an enantiomer. Well, of what? Where's the other one? It's, it's, a, it's a word that implies a relationship like sibling. You can't say this person's a sibling. Well, of whom? Where's the other sibling? See, it makes no sense. It's kind of like that. And so I would say enantiomers are um, here I am, look at me, about to uh, flat out copy it from my uh, um, class notes. Well, anyway, I would say enantiomers are two molecules with at least one chiral carbon. There could be more, but there has to be at least one. Guys are trying to make molecular models with some common household items and some not so much <laughs> with at least one chiral carbon. So there could be two or more. And we'll get to that later. We'll probably talk about that mostly on Wednesday. But you need at least one. Whoops. Carbon. That are mirror images of one another of this type that we've been discussing, non-superimposable mirror images. But I think we'll be okay if we say that are mirror images, such that it's as though one of them were left-handed and one of them were right-handed. That's what we mean by enantiomers. Uh, but you do need uh, at least one chiral carbon. Uh, I don't know how well this fits here, but I have this irresistible urge to add at this point. Uh, <laughs> oh, chat, you're hilarious. Um, uh, what does it mean when there's more than one chiral carbon? Like, how do you deal with that? How many possibilities are there? And I did say that there's very little math in this class, uh, but one formula, at least for chapter five stuff, that's pretty simple, uh, that's not bad to bear in mind is two to the power n. That's not so hard. I think you can remember that. Two to the power n. And here's what this tells you. Uh, that tells you the maximum possible number of stereoisomers in a compound with n chiral carbons. So maximum number How am I going to fit stereoisomers all in one line? Well, hyphenated stereoisomers. With N chiral carbons and a compound that has N chiral carbons. Sorry, there we go. And so you'll notice that I phrased that very carefully. It's the maximum possible number of stereoisomers. That, that means there could be fewer if there's n chiral carbons, but two to the n is the absolute maximum possible. And this is not nearly as, uh, uh, this is not nearly as bad as it sounds. Let's start with the simplest case where n equals zero. There's no chiral carbons. Well, two to the zero power is one. That means you just get one thing. The carbon's not chiral, the molecule's not chiral, and there's just one thing. Uh, what if there's one chiral carbon, like with these uh, bromochlorofluoromethanes? Well, two to the first power is two, and that's the number of stereoisomers you get. And you couldn't possibly get any more than that. And as it is with one chiral carbon, you will always get these two stereoisomers. They will be enantiomers. They will be mirror images. What if you start having two and three and four chiral carbons? That's where things get exciting. 
and I, I know we'll look at least at a couple of cases where there's two chiral carbons. Well, two squared is four. So that means the most you can have is four possible stereoisomers, not five. Four is the maximum. There's also a bizarre case with two chiral carbons where you don't have four stereoisomers, you actually have three. And that's going to be another thing that I'm really not going to emphasize, though I will at least mention it next time. Welcome to meso compounds. They are bizarre. So we won't spend a lot of time on that. I don't think I'm going to hit that too heavily in the next exam. Again, I think I left the idea present in the owl so you at least get exposed to it. Uh, but it's not something you run into terribly often. But th that's next time. We'll go over all that on Wednesday. Uh, but you can keep going. If there's three chiral carbons, two to two cubed is eight. There's four, two to the fourth power is 16. And you can keep going. That tells you the maximum number of possibilities in terms of stereoisomers. There could be fewer, but there will never be any more than that. Uh, an extreme case, which is going to get us into today's reef session, which by the way, I'm just going to take attendance, but I do have a little exercise for you guys. Uh, it's going to involve cholesterol. Cholesterol is eight chiral carbons. And if you work that out, two to the eighth power, I believe, is 256. So that means there's 256 possibilities of ways you can put this molecule together to get a different stereoisomer. Yet of all those 256 possibilities, of all the cholesterol that's biosynthesized in everyone's bodies right now, you get one of those 256. I think that's absolutely astonishing. That just blows me away how, how selective biochemistry is. And like I said, I'm, I'm no biochemist. I can't claim to be an expert on it. Uh, but, but something like that just, something like that just uh, knocks my socks off. So the answer, yeah, for the example above with CHCLBRF, how many stereoisomers would there be? Two. And the two are the, the ones you can see over there. So you will never get more than that. You have one chiral carbon, two to the first power is two. That's where knowing that formula is helpful. Uh, good. So uh, that then, uh, actually, here is probably as good, good a time as any for me to introduce this R and S system. And I'm going to have to, uh, I, I don't want to just sort of say, well, here's the thing, learn it, live it, love it, especially since you won't even really be learning it. Like I said, I, I, don't, I don't relish the thought of making you guys go through that much effort, or so much effort to get so little information out. So I would say at least if I ever ask you a question that requires knowing whether something's R or S, I'll give that to you. I'll just tell you this carbon's R, that carbon's S. Uh, but, uh, but I think you at least see the issue. We can't call both of those guys bromochlorofluoromethane. They're different compounds. We need uh, to be able to distinguish them in their names. And uh, I'll take a look at those in just a moment, but I need to put this in a little bit of historical perspective so you understand the importance of this, uh, which gets into another way of distinguishing enantiomers by their name that you might have heard of. This is the plus minus system. And I don't know if you heard about that at all in Gen Chem or in your uh, biology classes, if they went on about plus and minus tartaric acid and uh, Pasteur's work, which, by the way, involved looking under a microscope and separating right-handed from left-handed crystals. I can't imagine the dedication this took. But Louis Pasteur, the, that Pasteur, same Pasteur, was the same to uh, really get a handle on this issue of uh, chirality. In any case, um, would the, the place that, where do the plus and minus come from? That comes from a kind of experiment called polarimetry which again, I don't expect you guys to be able to write brilliant essays on how to run a polarimetry experiment. But the idea is this, if you dissolve up a chiral compound in some concentration and you put that solution into a cuvette of some size, I think it is to be one decimeter, which is 10 centimeters, uh, and then you shine plain polarized light through it, which means you put a polarizing filter on it, it also is to be of a certain wavelength. I believe they use the sodium D emission, which is some certain number of nanometers that I don't know, and I certainly don't expect you guys to know. It's visible, though. It's yellow-orange light, in case you're curious. Uh, and what happens is once that beam of plain polarized light goes through the solution, 
it rotates the plane of propagation one direction or the other. This is actually something I used to get wrong when I, when I, when I was beginning in teaching. Until at my previous school, one year, a very kind physics major took me aside and uh, very politely set me straight. So you need to understand it's not that the beam bends. It doesn't, you know, the beam doesn't bend. It's just the direction of the plane of propagation, the plane polarized light, will tilt one way or the other. It's a subtle difference, but it's, it's important. I, I want to get it right anyway. And so at the other end, there's some detector that says... Uh, your propagation plane bend 30 degrees to the left or 27.2 degrees to the right or 114, degrees, you know, it, it'll tell you how much it bent. Or maybe the answer will be it went straight through. The specific rotation was zero. And uh, all of those are possibilities. So I will tell you that if you put a solution into the polarimeter and you get a specific rotation of zero, that means either the molecule's not chiral or you've got what's known as a racemic mixture. A racemic mixture is defined as a 50-50 mixture of two enantiomers. And so they exactly cancel, and the overall rotation is zero. So it means one of those two things, though, if you do one of these experiments, uh, and you get a specific rotation of zero. Either your thing's not chiral, or you've got a racemic mixture. And you, the, I've defined that term in the class notes. R-A-C-E-M-I-C, -E racemic. Uh, all that's fine. But there's one big shortcoming to all this. In order to figure out whether you're dealing with the plus enantiomer or the minus enantiomer, you need to do an experiment. And so the two enantiomers will have the same um, magnitude of rotation of that plane of propagation, but opposite in sign. So if one of them is minus 37.2 degrees, the other one is plus 37.2 degrees. So, but in order to figure it out, you have to do an experiment. That's no good. I, I'm afraid I will not be supplying you with a polarimeter under your chair when you take the next exam. You get the idea. Uh, we want a way of being able to just look at the structure and know which we're talking about. Isn't one for clockwise and the other counter? Uh, roughly speaking, yes. Uh, the one we associate with clockwise is going to be R, although, again, I'm not going to make you responsible for the whole method. I mean, I think you could learn it. I just, I, I've said it already. I just, I, I don't see any reason to put you guys through so much trouble for so little information. So, yes, the, the R enantiomer is the one that we associate with clockwise and the S with, with counterclockwise. And like I said, I did leave some questions in OWL so you can at least be exposed to the idea. And I, th I think you'll come to the same conclusion I did. This is an awful lot of work to come up with R or S when I could have flipped a coin and been, had a 50% chance much more quickly. Okay, so let me, since I do know how to tell if it's R or S, let me see. The bromine's going to win, then comes the chlorine. This looks like a right turn or a clockwise, so this is the R enantiomer, and that means this one must be the S enantiomer. Just let me verify that. Bromine, chlorine, fluorine. Yep. Yep, yep. So this one would be R bromochlorofluoromethane, and this one would be S bromochlorofluoromethane. And, and you will definitely have one or the other. And incidentally, you can also see where this two to the power n thing comes in, right? Because what if there's two chiral carbons? Well, then your possibilities are RR, RS, SR, SS, right? Those are the only possibilities. And so what you'll find, we'll get to this next time, what you'll find is you actually wind up with two pairs of enantiomers, except in the really annoying case where RS and SR are actually the same thing. There's your meso compound. They are bizarre. Like I said, I'll at least introduce the idea and explain it a little to you, just so you've heard the notion, but it's, it's not something you run into very much. It's actually not even all that hard. It's just kind of bizarre. Uh, how is R and S again? Oh, well, R and S are going to be the, the names for the two different chirality centers. One of them will always be R and one will always be S. And again, I, I'm not going to ask you to learn the method, although if, if you really want to, I'm not going to stop you. It's not so different from telling E from Z in alkenes. It's the exact same kind of thinking, except instead of doing that twice, you have to do it four times. And then instead of just comparing two things, you have to compare all four of them. And you also have to make sure your lowest priority group is pointing in back. So you see, it's a pain. It's just a real pain is all.
that probably that's probably served for me to just get a lot of people uh, curious and you know look into it. But I I don't plan on putting that in the next exam. So if there's something that you need to know whether it's R or S, I will give that to you. Uh, now, certainly, if uh, uh, here's a fair question I could ask. A certain molecule has two chiral carbons both in the R configuration. What are those configurations on its enantiomer? Well, I'd expect you to say SS. If this one's RR, then the enantiomer is SS. So when you flip between two enantiomers, you flip all of the chiralities of all chiral carbons, however many there might be. So, so uh, and, and if it's just one, then it's easy. One will be R and one will be S. If something is three chiral carbons and you're looking at the RRS uh, uh, st uh, stereoisomer, then its enantiomer would be SSR. You just flip all of them. I think you'll find some questions like that in OWL. Now, what if you flip just some of them, but not all of them? Welcome to diastereomers. We'll get to that next time, too. But when there's just one chiral carbon like this, it's simple. One's R and one's S. Now, there is one last thing I also want to say. Uh, since someone asked about uh, clockwise and counterclockwise. The, th the RS thing and the plus minus thing have no relationship. So I just don't want you thinking that R is always plus or S is always minus or something like that. It isn't. There's no relationship between the two. Some R stereoisomers are plus and some are minus. Likewise, some S stereoisomers are plus and some are minus. And the only way you'll know is by doing an experiment which is not very convenient. That's why this system, it, it happens to be called the con ingold prelog system, named after the people who came up with these rules to determine how to tell R from S. Uh, that's why this is so powerful, because all you need to do is examine the structure, and you can tell what you're dealing with, and you don't have to do an experiment. So that, I realized that was kind of a long slog into a little bit of history, and as, as I think I've said, I am no history buff, which I am not proud of, but I consider myself rather weak at history. Uh, but, but sometimes a little of that really helps to, to explain why something's important and why we care about it. Good, so where are we at? We're at 334, 335. Let me just see if I have anything else. Um, let's see. Good. Uh, well, I mean, Tell you what, let's do our, uh, I mean, I'm basically just taking attendance. So um, uh, please do register your attendance if you haven't already. So it's the 10 points are on me today and I am a little behind in downloading your reef grades. I'll try to, well, I have to do that sometime this week if I wanna calculate estimated class grades. So, um, wait, I'm not sure, did I do that right? PowerPoint. We'll do it like this. Good, so hopefully now everyone can see it in chat as well. Oh, wait. Um, okay, so here we go. That's cholesterol. And no, for goodness sake, you don't have to memorize that, geez. <laughs> but that's the structure of cholesterol. Uh, and there are eight chiral carbons. See if you can find them all. And I'll just give you a few minutes to play with that. Well, uh, it's not showing up on Reef because there's no poll. I'm just taking attendance. But you should be able to see this picture on Zoom. Hopefully. But yeah, you just get 10 points for attendance today. And some of these are a little harder to, yeah, some of them are a little harder to find than others. And let me show you a tricky one. It's tempting at first to say that this carbon is chiral, but it's not. It is two methyl groups attached. And you remember the rules. As soon as there's any two of the same, doesn't have to be two hydrogens. As soon as you see two of the same group, game over, not chiral. So this carbon is not one of them. That one is not chiral. Well, I'll tell you two others that aren't chiral. 
What about these two that are involved in the alkene, in the double bond? Those are sp2 hybridized. Game over, not chiral. Well, I think they did. So the one I was pointing at at first was this one in, the, in kind of the isopropyl group in the end, right? The one with two methyls, that's not chiral because it has two methyl groups on it. The other, the two involved in the alkene, of course, are right here. And those are sp2 hybridized, game over, not chiral. So those are not among the eight chiral carbons. Well, I'd probably let that go long enough. Uh, there's my answer. Uh, and some of, these are, uh, some of these are actually worth going over. So on this carbon here, of course, it's got the OH. It's got the hydrogen that's not being shown. And you say, but these two are both CH2s. Aren't they the same? Well, no, they're not. Because if you go out one more carbon, you'll see they're now different. This one is another CH2, and over here we've run into an alkene. So when we talk about two groups as being the same, we mean we have to go all the way out to the ends of the chain if it's acyclic, or all the way around the ring if it's cyclic. And if you go all the way around the ring and it, everything's exactly the same, well, what that means is there's a plane of symmetry running right down the middle of the ring, including your, your carbon atom, so that carbon is not chiral. It's the same as having two H's or two methyls or two chlorines. So, uh, so th in, in other words, this, these two, though, are not the same. That means these CH2s are not the same. That means that carbon is chiral. Over here, we've got a methyl group. We've got this CH2. We've got a tertiary carbon over here, and we've got this sp2 hybridized carbon. They're all different. So even though they're all carbons, those carbons are all different. So that's why I thought going over this would be good. And I'll put this up on eCampus. I'll try to remember today. Uh, similar situation over here. You've got the hydrogen. Uh, you've got two tertiary carbons here that are different from one another, right? One's part of a five-membered ring. The other one is not. And then you've got that CH2, which is yet a different thing. And so... Uh, these two here are chiral, that one's chiral, you've got sort of the whole big mess here, you've got, uh, it looks like chiral carbons are wherever dashes or wedges are located. Will that always be the case? I'm going to say no for my one word answer to that, uh, because uh, you, you could use wedges and dots whenever you like, it's just not always necessary. But I, I wouldn't necessarily come to that conclusion. I can very easily show you a carbon atom that's uh, not chiral, uh, but draw it with wedges and dots. Uh, let me go back to my whiteboard. Uh, I don't know. What if I were a big meanie and I went like that? Well, there's wedges and dots. But now that carbon actually has three methyl groups on it. However, as soon as I do this, now it's chiral. Does it matter which side of the bond the asterisk is on? No, I was just using an asterisk to mark it. But I think with all of those, the asterisk was at a carbon atom. So I, I, I tried to be as uh, unambiguous as I could. That, that, that's just, I just thought that'd be a convenient way of marking it. I didn't really mean anything in particular by it. But I'll put that on eCampus so you can uh, check your answers again. Now, actually, a similar compound to this, and maybe I'll end with this, is the two enantiomers of 2-chlorobutane, which we've almost got. So that's one of them. Uh, and there's multiple ways of drawing the other. You could just flip any two of them. If you put, for example, the hydrogen over here and the chlorine in back. Anytime you switch any two groups, by which I mean you literally pluck them off the carbon and reattach them in the other position. Anytime you do that, you will always switch R to S and S to R. In fact, let me go and figure this out. What are we going to have here? The chlorine's going to win then the ethyl, then the methyl, and the hydrogens in back looks to me like a right turn. So this one's R, and this one then will be S. But that's not the only way to draw it. You could also have just flipped over the whole molecule, like in, in the, just flipped it over in the plane, and then you would wind up with 
trying to draw the mirror image. Then you would wind up with, let's see, fluorine out here. Yep, and hydrogen in back. I've just put basically a mirror plane right down like this. And so I've inverted them. So this one will also be S. Or you can look at this the exact same way as we looked at this one. Here I've left the hydrogen and chlorine in the same places, but I've switched the ethyl and methyl groups. And as soon as you switch two groups, you've flipped R to S and S to R. So, uh, so that's one way. There are other ways to draw this too. Uh, one way that we will, trying to see if I have a good way of doing this. You can also kind of look at it from straight on top like this. And from this view, it looks to me like the methyl group is going away from me. I sort of like have my eyeball right here, hovering between the hydrogen and the chlorine. And then my hydrogen is going to be coming up towards my eyeball. And uh, my chlorine also up towards the other side of my eyeball. So hydrogen here, chlorine here. And then this ethyl group is going back away from me here. So I'm just going to go CH2, CH3. That's another way to do it. And we'll talk more about this method of drawing uh, chiral compounds next time. This will become handy next time because uh, we'll learn this can be uh, abbreviated further into the so-called Fisher projections, which I think are going to be the most useful for us when we discuss carbohydrates. So these so-called Fisher projections are shorthand for this type of drawing. So this and this and this are all equivalent. These are all, and, and actually that. Those are all valid ways of drawing the S enantiomer. We'll talk more about this kind of system next time. Uh, let me just make sure, oh, I have one minute left to talk about properties of enantiomers. This is very important uh, because this gets into the application uh, in various pharmaceutical fields or whatever you would like. Uh, and also, points out why it is so expensive to separate enantiomers. And the reason is enantiomers have identical physical properties with one exception. But all of the other normal physical properties, solubilities, melting point, boiling point, all of those are exactly the same for two molecules that are enantiomers. The only way they differ in terms of physical properties is in that polarimetry experiment that I discussed before. One of them will rotate the plate of propagation clockwise and the other one counterclockwise in, to the same degree, but in opposite directions. And that's the only difference. And it will probably be already kind of evident to you. It's gonna be pretty hard to separate these two molecules based on that. So there are ways of separating enantiomers, but they are very expensive and time consuming. So it's very difficult. That's not gonna turn out to be true for diastereomers, which we'll learn about next time. That's going to turn out to mean uh, stereoisomers that are not mirror images. Those are in general quite easy to separate because they will have different physical properties. But the enantiomers are a problem. They're very hard to, to separate because they have the same physical properties, except for uh, the direction of rotation of propagate, plane of propagation of light. Can I repeat the difference one more time? Oh, between enantiomers, the, the only way they differ is in this specific rotation thing which way they rotate the plane of propagation of plane polarized light. Everything else is exactly the same. Same solubility, same melting point, same boiling point. All the things you learned in Gen Chem that are usual ways of separating compounds does not work for enantiomers. They have identical physical properties except for that polarimetry thing. So that's why they're so hard to separate. Well, I'm actually a minute over time, so I think I have to kind of leave it there, but it's a good place to leave us for next time. So have a great day. We'll see you Wednesday.